Trends are always evolving, but so are you. That's why Macy's has the top brands, great value, and inspiration you need to own your style. This week, we're helping you do spring your way with designer suits for work or weekend, 50 to 75% off, and three-piece comforter sets, just $19.99. Plus, Macy's Star Rewards members earn on every purchase, except gift card services and fees. Savings off sale and clearance prices, exclusions apply. Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the magnificent Monday edition of The Yard. Man, great time. Lots to talk about. It's been a busy couple of days since we were together. Lots happened. Lots been reported. Lots transpired. Bulldogs won some baseball games, too. Before we get too uh, involved in all that, let's tip the cap to Mississippi State softball. Wins uh, a game at Florida over the weekend. Big win. One of the biggest wins in school history. Not the biggest, but one up. Big, big win. First SEC dub for Coach Samantha Ricketts' team. So, uh, that's a big one. So, congratulations to the Mississippi State softball team. Now, sticking with women's sports, we had a big announcement over the weekend. Told you guys on Friday that we were zeroing in on a hire for the women's basketball program. I have said on this show for some time, I did not expect it to be Doug Novak. Gone as far as saying that he wouldn't be a candidate. He played his way in, or shall we say, he coached his way into candidacy. He was given a formal interview. He was given a serious look from Mississippi State. Bulldogs, I like to go with Sam Purcell from Louisville. I think it's a good hire. I won't go so far as saying it's a great hire because you got proof in the pudding. Right? I mean, there's nothing at this point to support the fact and say, hey, it's a great hire. Was he a great candidate? Yes. Do I think it's a great fit for Mississippi State? Yes. Do I think this is going to lead to some great basketball? I absolutely do. But I'm not going to sit here and say, hey, it was a great hire yet. The proof's in the pudding. Was it the right hire? I believe so. I do. Now, we're going to spend this segment of the show talking about the future And we're going to talk about Sam Purcell. We're not going to talk about anything else. We're not going to talk about Doug Novak. We're not going to talk about Nikki mccray Pinson. We're not going to talk about Vic Schaefer. We're not going to talk about Sherry Fannin Otis. We're not going to talk about any of that stuff. We're not going to talk about Carl Smusco. We're going to talk about Sam Purcell. The rest of that stuff, while important, it's just details. Now, my initial impression, I'll share with you a couple things. Some insider trading stuff, right? So we find out on, uh, let me think here, the days all run together after a while. I was on the road every day last week, it seems. Found out Thursday that the hire was expected to come within 48 hours. Kind of tipped you guys on that Friday and said I felt it was very, very close. Thought it might leak into Monday. It didn't. It all takes place on Saturday. We had the formal announcement on on Sunday. Now, there will be a time when you all will be able to come and greet Coach Purcell and Megan and their uh, their three daughters. It's big. But we wanted to get Sam to speak as soon as possible. You know, the sooner he spoke to all of you and kind of delivered part of his vision for Mississippi State women's hoops, the better. I think it was important for you guys to hear from him in his own words and not just in a written story. You know, we've got video up over at jeanspage.com. You can go read a Robbie Fox article. So it got tipped that was going to happen. Make some calls. And you know, we knew that Carl Smesco was out kind of working through some things and uh, had a good source say Cohen is going to hire an elite recruiter. Not just, you know, one that's on a good run going to hire one that has recruited among the national elite you know for several years and I said well that's got to be the associate coach at Louisville and they go yeah yeah looks like it unless something falls apart here in the final minutes that's going to be it eventually the news is out you know we, we had our stories ready to go just kind of waiting for things you know cause we, we, in the past we've had stories ready to go and things changed. We were prepared. It's formally announced Sam Purcell takes over at Mississippi State that evening. 
sitting there watching a little Netflix, watched uh, pieces of her. If you haven't watched that, it's an outstanding, outstanding series on Netflix. I encourage you to watch that. So I'm finishing that up, and I get a text from a number I don't recognize. It's Sam Purcell. Tell me how excited he is. Looking forward to meeting everybody. Now, I've been covering Mississippi State since 1997. Been a Mississippi State fan my entire life. I have never in my life had a brand new coach at Mississippi State text me to tell me they were excited to meet me the next morning. It's never happened. That's not to say we hadn't had some great coaches, not to say that I hadn't had some great relationships with our coaches. I have. Still maintain relationships with some of our former coaches. But I've never had a coach say, hey, you know, hey, really excited about this opportunity. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow at the presser. Seems like a small thing, not to me. I think it's pretty clear that Sam Purcell gets it. Sam Purcell understands it's important to hit the ground running. So I already have a positive impression of him because of, number one, you know, his resume as a recruiter, but number two, the fact that you know, he, uh, he took it upon himself to kind of reach out and say, hey, here's what's up. We get to the presser yesterday. I couldn't have been more pleased with his presence, his poise. He is a guy that's never searching for the right answer. He just kind of gives you what's on his heart. I, a great communicator. I love what he said, too. He said when he reached out to our players and he got, got the phone list and uh, spent Saturday evening talking to your players, their families. He goes, you know, you didn't come here because of me, but I came here because of you. That's a good way to have it. That's a good feeling to have. I can see why he's a great recruiter. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you we're not going to have some ladies hit the transfer portal. We may. But that's a temporary setback. We're going to be a good basketball program again. Sam Purcell is a guy that's worked his way up. Started out as a student coach at Auburn. He's an Auburn grad, originally from Dalton, Georgia. While he was a student coach, he earned his bachelor's degree. From 2003 to 2005, he was video coordinator and an administrative assistant. Worked his way up to an opportunity at Tulsa with the Golden Hurricane as an assistant coach. He married Megan Champy. That's uh, the daughter of legendary Auburn women's coach Joe Champy. He leaves Tulsa, goes to Georgia Tech as a video coordinator, works his way onto the floor as an assistant coach from 2009 to 2013. Then he joins Jeff Wall's staff at uh, Louisville from 13 to 17. As an assistant, he is promoted to an associate coach at 17 through now. And I don't know if you've paid attention, but the cards are now um, a number one seed in the NCAA Women's Tournament. Nine years at Louisville. Had some other opportunities, waited it out, and got this one. And as he mentioned yesterday, too, and I thought this was an important comment, too, you know, he was on staff when we beat Louisville in the Final Four. He knows what you all are capable of. He knows that you will take over an arena and help will your team to victory. He's seen it firsthand from the losing end. And now here he is. Is our head coach. I do like the hire. Again, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's a great hire because I think that that's, uh, that remains to be seen. I did speak to a member of the selection committee at Mississippi State yesterday following the presser. This individual told me from the very first time they sat down with Sam Purcell, they're like, you know what, hey, this could be the guy. This could be the next individual to be Mississippi State's next great women's basketball coach. The second time they sat down, thought, yeah, this is a guy. This is the guy. And now here we are. And after meeting him, having a chance to interact with him during the presser and after, I can see why. He's a very gregarious, outgoing personality, guy that looks you in the eye when you're talking. He doesn't just sit there and wait for you to finish so he can jump in. You know, he's not one of those kind of people that just hears you, he listens to you. So I'm impressed. So we'll see how things go. But uh, it's good to get that thing done. It's good to get it finished. I know there was a lot of support for Doug Novak. It's very noble. And, again, we're very grateful to Doug for what he's done. But uh, that is now behind us. We look forward to beginning the Sam Purcell era 
here at Mississippi State. Let's thank our good friends at Bulldog Burger Company, longtime sponsors of the show. I will be in there this week. Looking forward to that. Trying to decide, you know, it's like I know I'm going. Am I going to have the Sloppy Joe sliders? Will I just wing it when I get there? Well, I just kind of walk in, look at the menu, and say, you know, I hadn't had this in a while. Boom. That's the thing. I don't just go to Bulldog Burger Company for one thing. I go there for a great quality meal, and I have a lot of great selections to choose from. Some days I want to eat a little light, a little fresher. So I have the BLT salad. I get it grilled. You may like it fried. I get it with ranch. You may like it with some uh, raspberry vinaigrette. I don't know. You can have it your way. But sometimes I go in there and I sit down. I want a great restaurant quality hamburger. And I say, hey, give me the pimentology add bacon. Make it quick. Great food, great service, great food at a great price. Be sure and go check them out today. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive here in Start Vegas. Gloucester Street there in Tupelo. And, of course, Lake Harbor Drive there in the Richmond, Flowood, Madison, Brandon, whatever area. Central Mississippi. You can get there. It's worth the few minutes to make the drive. And have the spring rolls. They'll make you and everybody around you better looking. It's science. Trust the science. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right, we spoke on Friday that Mississippi State needed a sweep. We got a sweep. Let's break down the sweep. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, oh, it's it's a great win. It's a big win. Well, they are big wins because we need wins. Princeton... It's a team probably within their league that will be decent. They're not going to be a tournament team. But uh, they have a little talent. But the reality of it is they were big games for us because we were 500. We needed a way to kind of, you know, get some separation between us and our losses. We've now won four or five. Maybe we're turning the corner. Hopefully. We've got a big weekend coming up in Georgia. But we, I think we answered some more questions this weekend. I like our team. I do. Are we playing at a championship level? No, we're not. But we can. I think we have the potential to play much better than we are today. Let's jump into that game one. And uh, you know, Preston Johnson didn't get off to the best of starts. And you're facing Princeton's ace, Jackson Emus. I heard him say it a couple different ways, but... Uh, it felt like this could be a low-scoring game, and then right out of the gate, we get down 3-0. We give up a solo home run on a full count to the leadoff hitter. Give up a single down the line and left. I'm thinking, what's Preston? Come on, Preston, where are you? Let's get it going. Nadir Lewis steps in, and I'm, I'm going to tell you this right now. You know, we've watched Mississippi State play now 17 games. We have not faced a hitter as polished as Nadir Lewis. And I include Jace Young in that, too. I know he's going to be the Big 12 player of the year. If Nadir Lewis stays healthy, I think that guy's a big leaguer, man. That guy has such good bat control. He's playing on an awful team. But the guy can really play. And what does he do in his first at bat at Duty Noble Field? He works and works and works the count. He gets down 0-2, fouls the ball off, picks up a couple of balls, and then next thing you know, it's three consecutive fouls, and we walk him. He wins the at bat, excuse me, we didn't walk him. We worked the count full, and then he doubles to right center. Now, all of a sudden, we're in a pickle. We're down one nothing. They got runners at second and third. And, um, you know, we, we don't have – we got the one out. You know, we had the, the single down the line where they uh, – uh, Cam James throws a guy at second. You know, so I'm getting ahead of myself here because I wanted to talk about Nadir Lewis. But uh, so Nadir is in scoring position with less than two outs. And you think – now that we've reset the deck here. You got a great hitter on base. You got four and five coming up. A base hit makes it a two-nothing ball game with their best pitcher on the hill. Preston Johnson bows up and gets back-to-back Ks. We get out of the inning. We get out of the inning. Three hits in the inning, one run, one stranded, and a couple of Ks. And again, I go back to that Cam James play. Cam rounds the ball off, throws the ball in the second, Probably a little bit aggressive there by Espinel, but uh, good play by Cam, for sure. Bottom of the first, that goes right to work. And uh, Emus is a guy, too, it has been really good. Luke lines the first pitch he sees down the left field line for a double. Cam James grounds out to second, but Hancock takes third. They walk Hunter Hines on four pitches. Logan Tanner flies out to left. He and his new walkout song. And then Kellum Clark 
home run to center field, three RBIs. It is a 3-1 ball game. Now, Kellum Clark is hitting the baseball better now than he has at any point in his Mississippi State career. Now, he's had some tanks, so get me wrong. But everything he hit this weekend was an absolute rocket. That is encouraging to see. Brad Cumbus reaches on an error. And Brad's got some pretty good wheels, too, you know. So he's a guy, too, that uh, because of those long strides, he gets down the line pretty quick, kind of puts pressure on defense. Slate offered walks, making a start at third. Then Compass goes to uh, third on the ball. Alford uh, goes to second. So, again, a chance for the big hit here. Two runners in scoring position, two outs. We don't get the hit. We don't get the two-out hit there from Tanner Leggett. But it is a 3-1 ball game after one. Preston Johnson goes right to work, really settled down here. K swinging, K swinging, ground out to third. Bulldogs are back in the dugout. And in the bottom of second, State adds to their lead. Lane Forsyth grounds out to second. Now, before I get too deep in the uh, discussion here, you know, Lane Forsyth's guy that's been in and out of the lineup. I thought his approach at the plate this weekend was the best it's been all year. And maybe even dating back to the beginning of the year last year, you know, when he was first inserted into the lineup, he did a pretty good job putting the ball in play. I thought he hit the ball better. I thought he saw the plate better. Didn't have a whole lot to show for it, but I thought he looked a lot more like I wanted him to look this weekend. So keep it up, Lane, for sure. Luke Hancock then singles to first base. Cam James singles to shortstop. Not not a play there. Then they end up throwing the ball away. Hines pops up to first. Tanner singles, singles up the middle and uh, take second on the throw, and we get Luke in. It is now a 4-1 ball game. And then Kellum Clark hits a laser out to center on the very first pitch he sees uh, for the third out. Top of three, Preston, a little bit of trouble here, but pitches around it, gets a case swinging, gives up a double down the line, a case swinging, they're ground out to second. So, you know, pretty minimal effort there. You give up the one hit there, but it doesn't really cause you any damage. Bottom of three, State gets more separation here. Cumbus grounds out to third. Slate offered walks again. Then Leg comes through with a double to left, puts runners at second and third with just one down. And again, we need the big hit here. We get it. And who is it? Lane Forsythe. There we go, Lane. Singles through the left side, both runs score 6 1. Got to be good for the young guy's confidence. Absolutely. Hancock flies out to center. Lane still second. And then KJ strikes out uh, swinging after a lengthy at bat. But it's 6 1. And the way Preston was pitching, you're thinking, you know, maybe we're okay. Maybe we're okay. You know how the bullpen adventure has been, though. You'd like some more runs here. But Preston really belt, bear, you know, really kind of bear down here. You get a fly out from Scannell. Uh, Granite strikes out swinging. We walk a bellow on five pitches. And then uh, we get a case swinging to get out of the fourth. Bottom of four, they make a pitching change, um, which was okay. You know, we, we were hitting Emus pretty well, better than anybody else says all year. Uh, Hines out at first, LT strikes out swinging, and then Kellum struck out looking. Probably the only at bat of the weekend you'd be like, ah, you know, just not there. Top of five, it's a one, two, three inning for Presto. I guess that's not correct. We face the minimum in the inning. We give up a single, then we strike out swinging, and we get a double play to get out of it. And it's started by the pitcher. And what's lost in the box score here is the play at short – by Lane Forsyth. The throw from Preston was down low and to his right. But Lane has such good dexterity, you know, he can make the adjustment and still make a quality turn at second. The guy's an elite defender. You've got to get the bat going. And, again, I think we saw some signs of life this weekend. But it's a great play by Lane Forsyth right there. I, I don't – I'll be honest with you. I don't think there are a lot of shortstops in America that could make that play and then turn the double play. I mean, it was an outstanding play. I mean, it really was. You know, Preston makes the play he's supposed to make, but didn't make the best of throws. And then Lane bells him out. And you don't you don't hear or see about that. But if you're a fan of the game, you can appreciate the effort there. Okay, bottom of five. Cumbus comes out. Homers to right field. Nice nice ride there. Good to see Brad get it going. Seven one state. Slate Alford walks again on four pitches. Tanner Leggett reaches on a fielder's choice. They force Slate at second. Leg still second, then Forsyth K swinging. But, again, I didn't think it was a bad at bat. Hancock lines out uh, to short, and that ends the inning. Top of six, 
really the first time that you really felt like uh, Presto may be uh, fading a little bit here. He gets a fly out to right, a case swing, and there's a walk. It's a double to right field, but we get a ground out to second to get out of it. That's the only time it really looked like he was tiring, and it's, you know, it's six innings, six innings of work there. And I know these guys are thinking, i got to extend myself as long as I can uh, just because of the fact that um, you know, the bullpen issues are what they are. So, you know, we give up that double there on the Grenette double uh, to make it a 7-2 ball game. But State gets the, the, the run right back there in the bottom of six. Cam singles through the right side. We take off and steal. We get thrown out here. Uh, if I remember correctly, too, this was the one that was in the dirt, just didn't get very far away. Kind of read it in the dirt. Guy makes a good play. Hines walks. LT strikes out uh, swinging. But then – Kellum Clark hits another rocket to left center, and Hines scores uh, from first. And Cumbus lined out a third, and he absolutely hit this thing on the screws. It's a, real, it's a really strong kid. It really is. 8-2 now, Mississippi State in the bottom of six. We get to the seventh. We bring in Pico uh, Khan. He comes in. We get a ground out to third, ground out to short, and a K swinging. And now you're thinking, okay, we just got to get six more outs. We've got a six-run lead. Let's get this thing finished up. We've been there before, though, right? Bottom of seven, one, two, three inning for State offered, leg and Forsyth all put the ball in play, but nobody reaches base safely. Top of eight, top of the order for Princeton. Pico's facing those guys. Give up a single to center. We get a fly out to center. Another single. Now you got runners on the corners. This could be a real – you know, damaging situation here. But the kid bows his back. Gets a, it's a K looking, which is huge. Now we've walked to load the bases, though. That's not good. Four-pitch walk after we get the second out there. You just need to make a pitch and get out of it. And rather than fold like a tent, Pico gets a K swinging, leaves the bases loaded. And at that point, it really felt like Mississippi State was going to win this game without any anxiety. That was the moment right there. That was Princeton's moment to kind of climb back in and make a game of this thing. And then our freshman lefty goes out there and gets out of it. You know, again, some of that is self-inflicted, but he gets out of it. And he'll be better for it the next time. Bottom of eight, Luke Hancock is hit by the pitch. Cam flies out to left. Hines strikes out swinging. You'd say, well, you know, maybe we can, the bullpen can hold it down. And instead, the Bulldog offense gets a string of two out hits here to put the game away. We talk about having killer instinct. We had it on Friday. LT walks, and then Kellum Clark hits a three-run bomb to right field to make it 11-2. At this point, the game is over. Cumbus follows with a double. Slate Offer gets a single. You know, so like here we are getting these big hits, putting pressure on Princeton, and then Jaeger flies out to center and actually hits the ball really well. But it's 11-2 ball game going into the ninth. We make a bunch of defensive changes and bring in Drew Talley. And I like Drew Talley. I think he can be a real factor for us in the bullpen. I don't think there's any question. One thing that I have learned about Drew Talley is he will compete. He will compete. He may get hit a little bit, but he's not a guy that's going to get up there and walk a bunch of people. He's going to get out there and compete. He's like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to get out there and throw you on the black. I'm going to paint the black. And if you hit it, you hit it. But I'm not going to give in to you. I'm not going to be scared to pitch to you. That's what works in college baseball. That's what works at Mississippi State. So I, I think Drew Talley coming in uh, here in the ninth, even though it wasn't you know, a perfect inning, I like the fact that you've got a guy that's not scared to get hit, a guy that's going to go up there and throw his best stuff up there and get you to, to swing at his pitch. Well, we open up. We, we, the first pitch he throws is a single to right field. Then we get the K swinging. There is in an infield single to put runners at first and second. Then we get a fly out to right. Runner tags and moves up. And then we pinch hitter comes in, we strike him out swinging. And the game is over, 11-2. It's a good job there, Drew. And, uh, I, again, I think Drew Talley is going to be a big part of things as we kind of move forward. I like guys that aren't scared to compete. Baseball is a team game played by individuals, and this is a guy that's not scared to do his individual part. Now, our prime shrimp player of the weekend, and we can go ahead and announce that now because it, it started on Friday and continued through Sunday. Well, you know who it is, man. It's Callum Clark. Callum Clark, the prime shrimp player of the weekend. I love prime shrimp. You will, too. Proud to partner with the New Orleans-based prime shrimp to bring you guys some delicious, easy-to-cook shrimp that you can get delivered straight to your door from primeshrimp.com. 
They've been peeling shrimp in New Orleans since the 1940s. Proud to debut exciting new products for you to serve restaurant-quality shrimp at your home in under 10 minutes with none of the usual fuss or cooking. Simply take a pouch of pre-seasoned shrimp, drop it in boiling water. You have a meal ready in a few minutes without all the prep, no peeling, no deveining, none of that. Order at primeshrimp.com, get it delivered straight to your door. Use promo code BONEYARD to save yourself a little cash. You'll be glad you did. they got three great flavors now. Got the New Orleans Alfredo, you've got the uh, Simply Seasoned, and of course the uh, the Louisiana uh, Crab Bowl. Try it today with a risk-free purchase. If you don't love it, you get your money back. It's a pretty cool thing. Again, exciting new product, and money-back guarantee orders over four pounds shrimp free. You'll like that French Quarter Alfredo. I called it New Orleans Alfredo, but it's not. It's French Quarter Alfredo, and that's the best thing. You Like you go ahead and boil your noodles. You boil your pot of water, too. You pour your shrimp in. You drain, bang. Bang. French Quarter Shrimp Alfredo. Right at your right at your own crib without a lot of trouble. You got to love that. All right. So that's game one. And, of course, we had, um, you know, game two got uh, – Got postponed, but uh, real quickly looking back at the numbers from uh, from game one before we take a bit of a break from baseball, do our top ten list. You know, looking back, you know, there's so many things you look at here. Thirteen hits, eleven runs, all of those RBIs, uh, six walks in the game for Mississippi State hitters, and just seven strikeouts. On the other side of the ledger, Preston Johnson goes six innings, six hits, three of those in the first inning. Allows two runs, two walks, 10 Ks, 102 pitches. Pico Khan comes in, two innings, two hits, no runs, one walk, three Ks, 30 pitches. And Drew Talley, the aforementioned Drew Talley, uh, works one innings. Doug gets up a couple of hits, pitches around it, a couple of Ks there, and uh, just 13 pitches. So great effort. Uh, of course, you're hitting your hitting star, Kellum Clark, three for five. Cumbus also two for five. Cam James, two for five. Luke Hancock, two for four. Luke, uh, three runs scored, too. That's one thing, too. We're getting Luke on base, and we're getting him around. We're getting him around. All right, time for today's top ten list, brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R. Close with Blair. I've known Blair Channel a long time. He's a friend of mine. He will be a friend of yours. And it, listen, I love all my friends, but I'll be honest with you. I love that I have some friends in various industries that maybe have some expertise that I don't. And that's Blair Chandler. If you're looking to refinance your home or purchase a new home, maybe you've got questions about that sort of part, that sort of thing, Blair's your guy. Visit him at closewithblair.com or you can text him or call him directly on his personal phone. That's 601 601- Five zero zero two three four four again six zero one five zero zero two three four four. You say, well, Steve, why would I want to re- refinance my home? Well, maybe you're tired of living paycheck to paycheck. Maybe, just maybe, you'd like to cash out a little bit, put some money in your savings. Maybe you got a wedding to pay for. Maybe you got some home improvements to do. Maybe you just need to consolidate some debt. Get your equity working for you. Blair can give you some uh, options to make that work for you. So if you're tired of being a little bit stressed and think, you know what, we never get to do anything. I'm always constantly working. All I ever do is live to work. Improve the quality of your life by consolidating some debt through a mortgage refinance today. Again, that's Blair Chandler at CloseWithBlair.com. All right, top 10 update for you guys, too. We have a new top 10, top 10. How about that? We have done about 350 of these. So it takes a big effort to get into the top 10. These are the most listened to top tens. Uh, and so I'm going to update them for you. I, I thought that we might have – I changed it up a little bit last week. I thought we might have a good run here. Uh, the Aussie list did great. Did great. Didn't make top ten low. Did great, though. You guys are great. So here we are, the top ten top tens, and then we'll give you today's top ten. Uh, number ten on our list is the Black Crows. Number nine is Phil Collins. Number eight, Waylon Jennings. The Zach Brown band comes in at number seven. And our new entrant into the top ten, and could possibly, Roy believes it might actually make it into the top five, possibly four, because you guys are still kind of keeping up with it. We're still getting a lot of impressions on the list. It's Hinder. I thought it might be Camelbox. I thought it could be Matchbox 20. No, it's Hinder. Hinder 
makes a charge towards the top five with just over 18,000 impressions. That is insane. Number five is Creed. Number four is the Ole Miss dedication because, you know, some of my obsessed Ole Miss followers wanted to know the songs that I had dedicated to them. That's number four. Number three, Chris Stapleton. Chris Stapleton, just over 19,000 for Chris. Recent rock covers, this came out when we were at Omaha, and I suspect many of you guys were just looking for a playlist to kill some of that drive. Recent rock covers, 19.4. But number one, and it does bug me a little bit, I'll be honest with you because I'm not a fan of this band, but I get it. And it's number one with a bullet, nearly 5,000 more impressions. It's Poison with 24.2 thousand impressions. It's crazy. But there you go. So there you go. So Hinder, welcome to the top 10. And kind of safely in the top 10 for a little while, I would suspect. All right, so I told you guys we're going to kind of do like a uh, top 10 list reloaded. So once a week on Mondays, we're going to do, you know, some classic bands that have extensive catalogs. And I'm going to rank their top 10 albums and then give you my favorite song from each album. So today we're doing Aerosmith. They have 15 studio albums. They are America's greatest rock band, as I'm just knocking something off the, uh, the table here. So there are a handful of albums that didn't make the list. Obviously, if we have 15 to choose from, we're going to pick 10. Uh, some didn't make it. And sadly, it's some of the more recent albums um, that didn't make it. Um, so, again, Aerosmith's one of my favorites. I know many of you love them as well. Let me give you the albums that did not make it. All right? Uh, Night in the Ruts and Rock in a Hard Place, and that's when Jimmy Crespo was playing guitar instead of Joe Perry. It's a tough time in the band. If you've read the uh, autobiography, Walk This Way, you you'll understand how difficult that stretch was there. They'd put together you know, a handful of great albums, you know, back to back to back platinum albums, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol kind of pulled the band apart. So those two albums didn't make it, and I'm okay with that. And then Just Push Play, Honkin' on Bobo, and Music from Another Dimension also didn't make it. All right, so let's talk about the ones that did. Okay, number 10 on the list was the first album after Joe Perry returned to Aerosmith, and it's the album Done With Mirrors. And I'll be honest with you, it's not a great album. It's a monumental album because of the fact that uh, you know Joe had returned to the band. They had signed with Geffen. It was a new day uh, with the band. And the, you know, the, the best song on the album is Let the Music Do the Talking. That's your, that's your song today. But that was actually a song that Joe wrote when he was outside of Aerosmith and recorded with the Joe Perry Project. So there was not shall we say, a huge reception for the reunited Aerosmith, but they got it going with the next album. Number nine, a classic album in the Aerosmith catalog, but a lot of people remember this album with kind of a revisionist history. This is when things were really starting to get out of length here. Um, There's a handful of good songs on here, but I think there is some filler here too. The album only goes 35-14 too. Pretty crazy. This is when Steven Todd was really beginning to go off the rails as an addict. And it's the album Draw the Line, which in and of itself is a drug reference. And so we're going to go with the title track here. We could have gone with Get It Up or uh, Kings and Queens. But Draw the Line is your number nine song from the same album, Draw the Line. Uh, Number eight, and this is a lot lot of people that will tell you that this album really kind of got them into Aerosmith. Uh, It went four times platinum. It's the album Rocks. That's your number eight album, Aerosmith Rocks. Pretty interesting title, right? Pretty easy, real straightforward. Um, So this is another one that's got a lot of great great tracks on it. A lot of innuendo in this album. I mean, honestly, you could pick a handful of of songs here and make a case for them. Uh, Licking a Promise, Get the Let Out, Nobody's Fault, Sick as a Dog, Rats in the Cellar, Last Child, also got a lot of airplay. But I went with Back in the Saddle. And to me, this is the album when Steven Tyler kind of found his voice. You know, some of the earlier stuff, it took him a little while before he really, you know, he really pushed the lengths of his vocal range. All right, number seven on the list, one of the more recent ones. I actually saw them on this tour uh, with Garbage. Uh, really enjoyed that. And again, this is a full-length album. And it's interesting, we just talk about Draw the Line and being 35 minutes. This one's over an hour. I remember when that was a big deal. A lot of uh, singles from this album. 
The first single from the album Nine Lives was Falling in Love is So Hard on the Knees, which is great. It is a great, great song. And I love Hole in My Soul. I think it's great. Um, Taste of India is another good one. This is, I, I think, a great album that maybe got panned to some by critics and people kind of stayed away from it. But the big hit from this one, and your number seven song is Pink. It's my favorite color. Pink is the sheets that we lay on because pink is my favorite crayon. Uh, love that song. It's been on the top ten list before. So from the Nine Lives album, it's Pink. Number six from the classic album, Get Your Wings. This is the second Aerosmith album released in 1974. And it's crazy, too. This album kind of pulled the first album along with it. Had a great cover track on this one of the Yardbird song, uh, Train Kept a Rolling. SOS is another one that had a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, airplay. Lord of the Thighs, another one, a little tongue-in-cheek innuendo song there from Steven Tyler. But we went with Same Old Song and Dance from Get Your Wings. Same Old Song and Dance, number six on the list. All right, number five, I went back. This I love this debut album from Aerosmith. It, it didn't have much fanfare, but once they kind of got established, a lot of people went back and bought that first album. I think the first album, even though the production value is a little bit sloppy at times, and I don't think that's uh, Aerosmith's prob- uh, fault, I love the cover of Walk the Dog, Walking the Dog from Rufus Thomas. Love, love, love their version of it. I could have gone a lot of different directions here. Mama Ken, a classic. Moving Out, a classic. One of my favorite songs in that debut album, and I used to play the harmonica part, is One Way Street. I love that song. Make It is Incredible, Somebody's Good. The whole album is great, man. And it's crazy to think about this, that one of the greatest songs in the history of rock music was recorded and in many ways kind of discounted until they re-released it as a single after Get Your Wings came out. And it's Dream On. Think about that for a second. One of the greatest songs in rock history was buried on a debut album that not many people paid attention to until after, after, Columbia re-released it as a single. And that's, you know, an album or two into this whole thing. All right, so there you go from the self-titled album, Dream On. Number four, a huge, huge album. Seven times platinum in the United States. Pretty impressive stuff there. And, of course, this is when they're with Geffen. They, uh, you know, they finished up their, their deal with Columbia and Clive Davis and released Pandora's Box, which is basically all of the uh, Columbia albums together. And uh, I, I think Geffen did a much better job promoting Aerosmith and uh, bringing the best out of them, too. Uh, this is an incredible album. And you can start all the way. And, you know, Desmond Child worked as a songwriter to help on some of this stuff, too. It was incredible. I love the album. There's really not a track on here that I don't like. You know, What It Takes is a great, great, great song. But I went with Love in an Elevator. Many of you may have gone with Janie's Got a Gun, which is great. But I went with Love in an Elevator. I could have gone a handful of songs here, but I think Love in an Elevator is classic Aerosmith, even in the modern day. All right, number two, and this is another huge album for them, after the reunion. It's the album Get a Grip. Now, you may be familiar with this one, Seven Times Platinum as well. It was very controversial because they had, uh, you know, the udders of a cow, and it showed that the udder was pierced. Well, it was photoshopped, but people lost their mind when they saw this. Oh, my gosh, it's so controversial, and people wanted a sticker put over it. You know, oh, my gosh, clutch your pearls. Goodness gracious. It's crazy how these things happen. Nobody knew what Photoshop was back then. People took everything they saw as real. It was in the infancy of the Internet. People were like, what's up with all this? It's crazy stuff. Uh, Get a Grip is a classic album. Again, goes over a length here, over an hour in length. Eat the Rich is great. I love the guitar on that. Get a Grip is good. Fever is phenomenal. Living on the Edge is great. A little uh, insight, too, that when they have the, uh, the, the part where it's just the bass drum, that's the bass drum that Steven Tyler played in high school that he stole from the high school when he left. Uh, Shut Up and Dance is pretty cool, too. That was on... Uh, it's on uh, Wayne's World 2. Wayne's World 2. They played that song live. 
A lot of people like crying. Of course, this was our first introduction to Alicia Silverstone, who's involved, I think, with three videos. Crazy with her and Liv was big, too. But the one for me, and, and maybe it's because I'm in recovery, and uh, I have read the story about Steven Tyler writing the song. It, uh, it means an awful lot to me, even to this day, too, even 30 years quint and sober. When I hear these songs, I'm taken back you know, to those first few amazing months of recovery in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and it's a song amazing. I love this song. I mean, I love it more than a friend. You know, it talks about, I kept the right ones out, let the wrong ones in. I had an angel of mercy to see me through all my sin. Even just saying that to you now, I get chills, because I think those are just some anointed words for me, I guess. But I love that song, and uh, it is arguably my favorite Aerosmith song of all time. And maybe it's just because of the life that I've led, but that's where we are. But number one, the number one album, in my estimation, in the Aerosmith catalog is album number three that went nine times platinum. And that's saying something in the 1970s. There were a lot of bands back in those days that didn't get to record LPs. People recorded singles. They recorded 45s. That kind of you know started in the 50s and 60s. And so like, I laugh today when people say, oh, you know, there's just a single serving stuff. Well, we, they had that back then, too. But Aerosmith was a band that uh, was really beginning to build. This is released on Columbia. Again, not a long-length album that was considered an LP, technically, just 37 minutes. But uh, a lot of great, great, great songs on Toys in the Attic, which I think is the best one. There is a, a, a Dr. Demento cover, big 10-inch record, that... Um, Got some airplay. Adam's Apple is a hidden classic. People know Uncle Salty. That song's written by Tom Hamilton. And, of course, the title track, uh, Toys in the Attic. But there are some legendary here as well. You know, You See Me Crying is a great track. Sweet Emotion. Everybody knows that one. You can't go ride the rock and roller coaster at Disney World without hearing Sweet Emotion. But I went with Walk This Way. Walk This Way is my favorite song off the Toys in the Attic album. It's a great album. It is an iconic album in American history, in American rock and roll history. So that's a top 10 albums with my favorite song from each one. And I appreciate you guys being uh, so complimentary of the Ozzy list last week. And, uh, you know, Aerosmith too, that mentioned the 15 studio albums. They've had what, seven or eight live albums. Of course, the greatest hits album that Columbia released trying to, uh, you know, trying to complete the record deal. You know, Big Ones was another one that was kind of a revisionist uh, greatest hits album that went four times platinum in the U.S. So Aerosmith is very much a brand. If you're unfamiliar, you need to be sure and check those guys out. And here's a little thing, too, I bet you didn't know, too, about the song Amazing. Uh, Lenny Kravitz sings backup vocal on that. Pretty cool, right? And Steven Tyler and Joe Perry sing backup on Motley Crue's uh, Sticky Sweet. How about that? Off the Dr. Feelgood album. You never know what you're going to learn on the Boneyard. So there you go. There's your top 10 list. If you uh, have ideas for the top 10 list, reach out to me and Roy. Let us know. You can find me on all forms of social media at Scout Steve R and Roy available at Dogmatic67. That's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. Dogmatic67. Uh, and uh, thank he and Izzy for their contributions to the show by putting those great lists on Spotify and Apple Music respectively. They don't. Nobody pays them to do it. They just do it because they love the show. And they think it'd be cool to have a list, and you guys can enjoy this. I think it's been a great addition. And again, it doesn't cost you anything, right? You listen for free. You hear a few commercials every now and again, which is funny to me. It's like, I wouldn't do this for free, right? I mean, it takes 90 minutes of my day to record and you know, an hour or so to get all my notes together. But um, it's nice that those guys are willing to kind of do something really cool for us uh, on the show. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart. I was in there last week. Stan the man on the mint. You know, Stan fell leaving the ball game the other day and uh, broke his arm and looks a little beat up. But uh, every time I see him, he looks a little bit better. Matter of fact, he had this really nice M over S jacket on. I was jealous. And you can find all of that great merchandise at Campus Bookmart. If you can't make it to town to see Stan the man, uh, you can visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That's BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. And that'll get you free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks. Any order less than $50, absolutely incomplete. If you're in town, you can go by and see the lovely, talented Susie and Miss Kathy Brown. Everybody up there will do a great job. They'll treat you like family because in their minds, you are family. 
And you know, there's a lot of new Mississippi State merch, and a lot of uh, national championship merch has uh, been reduced. And so you can get that stuff too, but a lot of new stuff uh, rolling in. Let's jump into recapping this doubleheader. Trends are always evolving, but so are you. That's why Macy's has the top brands, great value, and inspiration you need to own your style. This week, we're helping you do spring your way with designer suits for work or weekend, 50 to 75% off, and three-piece comforter sets, just $19.99. Plus, Macy's Star Rewards members earn on every purchase, except gift cards, services, and fees. Savings off sale and clearance prices, exclusions apply. It was a long day at the ballpark. Obviously, we saw Sam Purcell that morning and then had the opportunity, of course, to go cover a doubleheader. There is not a better place to spend your day than Dirty Noble Field. So it is a nine-inning game in game one, a seven-inning game in game two. And so, interestingly enough, Mississippi State starts Parker Stinnett in the opening game. Wasn't quite sure what to make of it. I'll be honest with you. I thought he would be an opener since he threw so many pitches on Tuesday. But he actually works deep into the ballgame and does a really, really good job. Maybe State has found their third starter uh, for the weekend. He is doing a much better job landing that breaking ball for a strike, and that was a bit of a challenge for him last year. Let's jump into the play-by-play. And again, State down one nothing after a half inning. Coming flies out to center, Espinel singles to right center, Lewis and singles to right field. I'm glad we don't have to face him for a while. Now there's runners on the corners with one out, and then Emus strikes out swinging. We get an infield single then, and it drives in the run. Ball hit really hard off of Luke Hancock. Luke will tell you he should have made the play. I don't know that he should have. Initially, they ruled it an out. It bounces off Luke, and he tosses to, uh, excuse me, it bounces off Luke, and Stanette picks it up and uh, shuffles it to first. They call him out. They review it. He was safe. They reverse the call. And uh, after watching the in-stadium replay there in the press box, it was obvious to me that he was safe. Good effort getting down the line there by uh, Scannell. Gives them a one nothing lead. And then there's a wild pitch, and there's runners a second and third, and we strike out Kelly on three pitches. So mitigate the damage a little bit there. But uh, I'm sure Luke will tell you he should have had it. Uh, it was ruled a hit. I would have ruled a hit as well. So it's one nothing Princeton. State gets a ground out from Hancock. K- KJ walks, fly out to left, and then LT grounds out to short on just three pitches there. So nothing doing for State there in the first outside of that walk. Princeton goes back to work here. We get a line out to left, and then we get a K swinging, and then it's uh, Granette, the nine-hole hitter, singles to right to get the top of the order up. We walk coming. Now we're in trouble again. We walk Espinel. Bases are loaded here, and this is ordinarily, like last year, 2021, Parker Stinnett might not have been able to wiggle off the hook. He does here. He gets a K swinging on three pitches. I like the intestinal fortitude of Parker Stinnett. I do think he is growing up and showing a lot more mental toughness. Uh, Kellum Clark then rifles a single to center. Cumbus then hits into the double play and then Alford grounds out to second on the first pitch. So, again, State gets a runner on base. We're not able to do anything with it. Top of third, great half inning for Parker Stinnett. It's a 1-2-3 inning. He strikes out the side. Bottom of third, State takes the lead, a lead they would never relinquish. We get a line out from Leggett, and then Forsyth, again, I mentioned to you guys, he's having better at bats. He wins the battle here. It is a 2-1 count, and he fouled off three consecutive pitches and then took back-to-back balls for a walk. Then Hancock is walk. Another long at bat here, running at the pitch count. Now they're runners at first and second, and then Cameron James, 0-2, really down in the count, is hit by the pitch to load the bases. And again, we're looking for the big hit here. We don't really get the big hit here, but we manufacture a couple runs. Hunter Hines, again, works the count for another walk. And so they have gifted us a run to tie the game. We score the run without the benefit of a hit. Four, three walks and a hit by pitch. And at this point, it is a 1-1 ball game. And Logan Tanner then flies out to center, and Hancock scores. It really wasn't very deep. I thought we may have a play at the plate, but Luke is in there rather easily. It's 2-1. And then uh, next thing you know, Hines overruns the play. We get into a little bit of a pickle out there. K.J. has got a break for third here. 
you got to break for third here. You got to you know, you got to make some things happen while they're running Hines down. Uh, KJ's got to take third here, and uh, you never know, may even come around and score. But you can't just stand there. I thought that was a base running blunder on Hines, and then you know we didn't do a lot to kind of help the situation, so we run ourselves out of the inning there. But it is a two-one lead for Mississippi State. Stinnett now gifted the lead, gets a ground out to the right side, and it's actually Luke Hancock arranges off the bag, doesn't get it. Second baseman does, and then Stinnett covers. Nice play there, getting over. Then it's back-to-back K's. It is a 2-1 lead for State. And we go 1-2-3. Clark flies out the center. Again, an absolute rocket is hit right at somebody. Compass flies out the center. Offered and grounds out to short. Top of five. And again, Parker's doing a good job here. Strikeout swing and fly out to second in short right field. And then a ground out to first unassisted. Bottom of five. Again, State with an opportunity here to get some things going. We don't. We get a single, an infield single, and then a walk to Forsyth. Again, I'm telling you, he's getting better at bats. Now it's first and second, nobody out. Do you bunt here? Well, Luke is not a guy that's especially skilled at bunting. Would have liked to have seen him get the bunt down there, too. I'm a small ball guy. I like to be able to move runners, especially in tight ball games. We get a fly out to left, so it's a non-productive out. And then Cam grounds one, and they force the runner at second. Have runners on the corners, need the big hit here, and then Hines flies out to left. So, again, a very promising inning Yields no runs because we couldn't get the big hit here. That proved to be a big deal later. Top of six, Stinnett gets a ground out to first, another ground out to first, and he covers both times. We get a K swinging, and the guy reaches on a wild pitch because the swatter just proved to be a little too salty to handle. He reaches first base, and then we get another K swinging to get out of it. So four outs in the inning for Princeton. Bottom of six. Again, we get a chance here to do something big. We don't do something big. We are able to expand the lead a little bit, but this is this was an opportunity for us to really gain some separation uh, between us and them. LT flies out the center, then Kellum Clark walks. Kumba singles. Now you've got runners at first and second. Alford then singles and drives in Clark, and you've got runners at first and second. So we get one good hit there, and then leg pops up to the first baseman, and then Forsyth reaches on a fielder's choice, and they force offered there at second. But, again, we put the ball in play there, but that could have been a much bigger inning for us. We do tack on the run to make it a 3-1 ball game. Had a much bigger chance, had a much bigger inning, and we blew it. We bring in Brandon Smith here. And, I, listen, I know Brandon against Texas Tech gave up a couple of big hits. You know, when you got a big lead there, we talked about that on Wednesday show. I am a Brandon Smith fan. I think he is going to help us tremendously down the stretch. He's got to be a guy that can roll out ground balls for us. Has a one, two, one, two, three inning here. Gets a fly out, a strikeout looking, and then a line out to first base uh, to preserve the leave at 3-1. Stay it again, bottom of seven. Top of the order up, and we go one, two, three. K looking, uh, K looking, and then a fly out to right field. So top of the order, the, the big three not coming through there. Uh, they're in the bottom of seven. Top of eight, kind of interesting here. Espinel flies out the right field. So, Brennan Smith faces four hitters and gets all four without any real trepidation. We bring in Cam Tower to face a left-hander. He gets a ground out to first from uh, Nadir Lewis, which was a big out at the time. Then we give up a single. They pinch hit, and we get a K looking. So, nice effort there from Cam Tuller, who has been up and down. Had a couple of really bad outings to start the year. And this past week, he has kind of come on, and we're going to need him. We can't just abandon any of these guys. Bottom of eight, and again, State with a chance here to make some things happen, and we don't. Logan Tanner gets a short fly out to short after a lengthy bat there. Then Kellum Clark doubles to right field, and you're thinking, okay, an insurance run here would be big. Cumbus then singles to the pitcher, just kind of rolled it past the pitcher there, kind of in a no-man's land after back-to-back fouls on an 0-2 count. Good job of him making something out of nothing here. So now you've got runners at first and second. Offered grounds out to short. Both runners move up, and you need the big hit here, and then leg strikes out looking. You know, again, a chance to expand the lead, and we don't. Those are the things that get you beat. Top of nine, just when we think, okay, that uh, we're just going to cruise through here. We had a lot of drama here tonight. A lot. So Marashiki, or Marashesky, excuse me, 
Pinch hits for Kelly and gets a single to right field. They pinch hit for Abello. We bring in Brooks Auger in place of Kim Tuller. They, at that point, left the pinch hitter, bring in another one uh, to pinch hit. So we burned one pinch hitter uh, to get another one. We get a, get a nice case swinging there from Brooks. Give up the single. Bring in Fristo to face uh, Grenette. And this is where things get a little bit crazy. He singles to center field. So now all of a sudden the bases are loaded with just the one out there. I think that's right. Yeah, one out. Yeah, the one out was the case swinging there. And so base is loaded, and it's a two-run ball game. You're thinking a base hit here, and we're heading to extra innings. And this is when things get really crazy. So leadoff hitter Brendan Cummings singles to left field. This is a ball that gets up in the sun, and Cam loses it. It falls. Well, the run's going to score easily, right? And good on our dugout for paying attention to this. So Cumming is watching the ball carry, and he passes Grenette, who is the runner at first. Now, Grenette, and, there, and there's fault on both sides here, but to me, ultimately, the blame is with Grenette, the nine-hole hitter, who was occupying first base. What's the rule when you're on base at first? On a fly ball, you go halfway. You freeze on a line drive. You're running on the grounder, and you go halfway on a fly ball. Well, he doesn't go halfway. And as a result, when Cummings rounding first, he passes Grenette. That ends up being an out on Cummings. So that's your second out and the only out that uh, the first day recorded. And so now you're thinking, okay, we, we just, we're a pitch away, but now it's a 3-2 ball game, a base hit here, and we're in a lot of trouble. We make some changes. We pull Alford out, put Skinner in second, shift Cumbus to left, and then Cam comes in the third. Mikey Tepper comes in, and three pitches later, the ball game is over. On an 0-2 count, he gets the ground out the short. And that thing was a missile, too. And Forsythe, a good job getting in front of it, actually bounced up off of him, out of his glove. He keeps his composure, makes a play, and the game is over. The game is over. It's a 3-2 win for Mississippi State. And you say, well, you know, we, we probably should have lost. Well, you know, we had met plenty of opportunities to put this thing away, and it nearly came back to haunt us. But, uh, again, a save for Mikey Tepper and a win for Parker Stinnett. Let's run those numbers real quick before we get into uh, the final game of the series. Uh, just six hits in the ball game. Two of those come from Kellen Clark and two from Brad Cumbus. Slate Alford and uh, Tanner Leggett pick up the others. Uh, and just three strikeouts. Putting the ball in play, just not able to find some holes there. Six walks in the game. We do at least leave seven on base, and uh, all of those or any of those could have been significant. Parker Stinnett worked six innings, four hits, one run, t- two walks, 12 strikeouts. 12, 91 pitches. Uh, it's crazy, too, to think about that. I asked him in postgame, how many times have you struck out 20 guys in a week? Never, never. Brandon Smith, uh, 1.1 innings, no hits, no runs, 1K, just 15 pitches. Cam Tuller works two-thirds of an inning, allows two hits and a run, and uh, one strikeout. 17 pitches for him. Brooks Auger uh, works one-third of an inning, allows a hit, and gets 1K on just seven pitches. Jackson Fristo works a third of an inning, allows two hits. We've got to get him going. He is too talented to not make a bigger contribution. We've got to get him going. And then Mikey Tepper, of course, comes in and polishes things off. So, again, that's the second win of the weekend. The series is now secured, but based on what we have done so far, we've got to get a sweep. The good thing for State in Game 3 is you have Cade Smith going, who I believe has been Mississippi State's most reliable starter on the weekend. Uh, that includes Landon Sims. Done a great job. We hoped for this, and now we're getting this. Not too much damage in the first. We get out of the first without giving up the lead for the first time on the weekend. We get a ground out to second, a walk, a fly out to center field, and then a K swinging of the cleanup hitter there. The former Friday night guy, uh, Jackson Emus, uh, batting cleanup, played first for them. Bottom of first, we had a fly out to left from Luke. Cam singles to right field. Really a nice job of hitting, kind of hitting it where it is and taking it the other way. Hines then reaches on a fielder's choice. They force Cam uh, at second. And then Hines goes to second on the wild pitch. They walk LT. We need the big hit. Come Clark singles to second to load the bases. And again, Still needing the big hit here. Cumbus reaches on the fielder's choice, and we do get the run home. Would like to have had a base hit there, probably played two runs, and then quarter grounds out to the pitcher. And so, again, State loads the bases, and we get just one. We leave them loaded. Uh, you know, 
didn't come back to haunt us, but we need to be able to get those those runs in. It's a one, two, three inning for Smith with a ground out, a pair of K's to get State back into the, the dugout in the bottom of second. And this is where we basically put the game away here. Uh, Jaeger centers to center field, and he starts in game two, did not start the morning game. Forsyth then walks. Again, there's Lane in the middle of things again. And you, it, when you get a nine-hole hitter that can turn the lineup over and allow the top of the order to hit with a pitcher to stretch, it's always a great thing. Well, then they walk Luke, which loads the bases with no outs. Cam James then gets on an error, hit the ball really well. Um, just didn't quite work out here. But uh, at the end of the day, everybody's safe. But, you know, that's what happens. You hit the ball hard and good things typically happen. It's now a 2 nothing lead. And then when we finally get the big hit, Hunter Hines comes up on the very first pitch, rips one down the line and right, two-run score, make it 4 nothing. Uh, LT with a sack fly RBI makes it 5 nothing. And then Kellum Clark, another home run to right field, makes it 7 nothing. Compass flies out the center, quarter flies out to right, and that's your inning. But it's 7 nothing. and with Cade Smith on the hill, especially in a seven-inning game, you feel like, okay, this one's probably in the bag. We walk Shapiro to open the third, and it's a fly out, a case swinging, and a case swinging uh, to end the, the threat there. Bottom of third, they make a pitching change, and they get us one, two, three. Ground out, pop up, and ground out. And we got a lot of soft contact against Jarvis. We, he kind of mixed us up a little bit. And that happens. You know, that, that happens sometimes. You know, it's like you get excited about it, and you know, all of a sudden a guy comes in and kind of throws water on the fire, and good job by Jarvis for doing so. Uh, top of four, Kate Smith still doing pretty well here. Really the first trouble he had of the day. We get a pop-up at the third and then back-to-back singles from the fourth and fifth hole hitters. And rather than fold, we get a case swinging on three pitches and then there's a ground out where they force the runner at second. And uh, that's the inning. Bottom of four, again, this is two, three, four here. State goes one, two, three, a ground out and a pair of Ks. Top of five, we hit Shapiro. Kate hadn't done that, I don't think, since week one. We get a pop-up to short, pop-up to first, and then a K looking. So even though we give them the leadoff runner, he never even advances to second base. Bottom of five, State expands the lead even more. And, and who is it again? Kellum Clark doubling through the right side. Absolutely ripped that ball by the first baseman. Skinner fouls out to left. Davis, then Jess Davis comes in and pinch hits for quarter. I don't know if Jess Davis shouldn't be in lineup more. A uh, great defender and is beginning to swing a pretty good bat. So he singles to right field, put runners on the corners with just one down. Davis takes second on a wild pitch. We pinch hit, um, let's see here. I guess Jaeger is the one that doubles down the line here. Yeah, they, they kind of got the box score out of order here. Jaeger doubles down the line, two RBI score. It is now a 9 nothing game. They change pitchers. Mesh comes in, K swinging, and Hancock lines out. Bottom of five, but it's a 9 nothing game. And, again, you feel pretty good about life right here. And rather than uh, continue to ride Cade Smith, who had, had pitched pretty well, we bring in Pico Kahn uh, again, and he gives up a home run to Nadir, Nadir Lewis on a 2-0 count. Thought the park might hold it initially off the bat. It didn't. It's now a 9-1 ball game. We get a fly out to left, a fly out to left, a single to left, and then a fly out to center, and then the inning is over. Bottom of six. You know, again, not a lot going on here for State, but now we're starting really to begin to pinch hit and let some guys get in there and swing. Uh, Slate offered pinch hits for KJ, and he strikes out swinging. Hines and grounds out the second on the first pitch. Von Siebert pitch hits for, for Logan Tanner and then um, flies out to right field. So it is a 9-1 ball game headed to the seventh. And, of course, remember, it is a seven-inning game. We lose, we, uh, we're going to lose Lee Pico out there. Let Cole Cheatham get some uh, some work, and I think he's going to be big for us matching up. He is a left-hander that has some real, really talented stuff. We get a case swinging. We get a walk, a case swinging, and then a ground out, and then the series is over, and State has swept. Looking at the numbers from uh, game three of the series in Princeton, let's start, obviously, with uh, Parker Stinnett. Or excuse me, Kate Smith. Excuse me. Five innings pitch, two hits, two walks, seven Ks, the one hit by pitch, 89 pitches, uh, really efficient effort from him. Pico goes one inning, two hits, the one run on the solo home run from Adair Lewis, and then Cole Cheatham. One inning pitch, a walk, and uh, two Ks. So getting it done. So we pieced it together, and it, while game two, the early morning game on Sunday, was a bit of an adventure, we do a great job getting the series. Now, we're going to play baseball today. Originally scheduled to play Binghamton 
uh, on Tuesday. But there is rain in the area forecast as opposed to rain all day. And then, of course, Binghamton can't play on Wednesday. they got to get back. They have been in Tuscaloosa. Let's take a quick look at those guys uh, before we move on and talk a little men's basketball. Uh, a lot a lot of controversy, obviously, with the NCAA tournament bracket. We're not going to jump into all of that. But uh, obviously some things out there with uh, Ben Howen's name attached to him, and so we'll address those things. But, uh, you know, looking at baseball for Binghamton, uh, the Bearcats are 3-9 and nine on the year. They lose two out of three at Lamar University to open the season. They win a 9-5 Sunday game. Then they lose two out of three at Old Dominion. And Old Dominion's put together a pretty good – program out there uh, they were ranked at the time uh, they they went 4-1 on Friday and then lose the other two ball games they get into Virginia military for a three-game set a lot of these games weren't competitive the Sunday game was eight seven winners and then this past weekend they were at Alabama they got swept by Alabama uh, 9-3 14-2 and 5-3 so this will be their very first midweek game of the year, which is interesting because you never know who they're going to pitch. And we all need to play. Uh, Mississippi State, obviously, uh, ready to go, going to throw Jack Walker. But, uh, you know, four games, you know, in the better part of four days for Mississippi State. So you know, you'd like to think it's kind of a Johnny Holstaff day for us. But uh, need Jack to go out there and have a good outing. Jack has been kind of up and down. But you expect that with younger guys. If he's on, it could be a short game. If he's not, somebody else will have to pitch. And the good thing is, is by playing on Monday, we got the rest of the week to kind of rest everybody up, so everybody should be available for the weekend. And, again, I think our rotation, if you have, if I had to call it today, I expect the tweet to say, Presto on Friday, Stanett on Saturday, and Cade Smith on Sunday. I think with the way Cade Smith is grooving, I think you'd like to keep him there. Not to mention you're going to have basically your most consistent guy going against the team's third starter. I think that bodes well for Mississippi State. we got to manage the weekends. You know, we got to find a way to manage some wins for us uh, to kind of make sure we get into postseason play. And uh, I, I believe this is a team, too, that uh, once you get into postseason play, we'll know exactly what to do. The pressure of it all uh, won't mean anything to them. Now, Bingington, too, looking at some statistics from these guys, too. You know, um, the record's not great. Should be a game that we win. Uh, Evan Sullivan leads the team, number 30 for them. He is their catcher, freshman catcher from Lansdale, uh, you know, Pennsylvania. 6'2", 185 pounds. Has uh, started all started 10 games this year, 343. Uh, two, four doubles, excuse me, uh, no, no dingers. This team as a whole has just six home runs. Not sure how the ball will carry today, but it's a little bit warmer than what we saw over the weekend. Uh, Andrew Tan is a guy, too, that uh, the only other guy of the regulars that is hitting above 300. I guess that's not correct. Their numbers are actually a little bit skewed here. Uh, Kavan Tully, or Kavan Tully, is another guy. He has only uh, played in eight games, but um, he's done a good job for them from uh, Newton, Pennsylvania, out of uh, Council Rock North High School, 5'9", 180. Did a good job for them, to say the least. Hitting 355. All right, looking at the um, the RBI guys, Garrett Matheny. Garrett Matheny has a dinger and seven ribbies for them. He's hitting a buck 52 though. Interesting that a guy that um, has only got seven hits has been so impactful. He scored five runs too. They're not a team that uh, runs the bases a lot, but they are very successful when they do. Just five of five and stolen bases. Opponents. Uh, have only stolen one base against them. Or excuse me, that's not correct. Oh, wow. I, look, I read the numbers wrong. So, Bingington has allowed 19 stolen bases in 20 attempts. That is a gaudy statistic right there. So, while uh, they've done a pretty good job hitting the baseball around a little bit, um, catcher's not done a really good job keeping people at bay. So, that's something to kind of watch, too, as we get into things. Uh, this evening, it'll be a six o'clock first pitch, six o'clock first pitch. Uh, so I don't know how any of that stuff's going to be broadcast, to be quite honest with you. I don't know. Um, oh, yeah, here, yeah, here it is. It's going to be SEC Network Plus. So you should be able to watch it on the app, which means that it'll probably be our guys on the call. Of course, we had the George this weekend, and uh, that'll be awfully interesting. Georgia, a team that, um, that obviously has always had good pitching. That's kind of Scott Strickland's calling card. 
not your Scott Strickland. There's a different one. Uh, been at Georgia a while now. Done a good, really good job there. But I would venture to say Georgia at times has been a bit of, of an underachiever, and, and that, that predates Scott Strickland's tenure there in Athens. But I'm eager to go. I'm ready to go. I've already booked my hotel, uh, be there the full three days. And uh, I like these game times. The getaway day on Sunday, playing at 11 a.m. Man, you got to love that. It's about a five-and-a-half-hour drive from Starkville 6, depending on if you hit traffic. So we um, – most of it will be interstate, so we can get out there on 20 and just roll on back to the house. Excited to get to Georgia, though. I think we have a good chance to take that series. I really do. And you say, well, Steve, you're, you're a bit of a homer. That's true. But I think when you look at Georgia, and we'll preview them later in the week, and because it is spring break, I hope to have to be able to do that, um, you know, Thursday night so you can have an early morning show and I can be on the road. But uh, when you look at, the, you know, the Georgia baseball team, you know, the, the, you know they're a team that, that kind of faulted, excuse me, faltered down the stretch last year. Had every opportunity to make it and then blew it. And, uh, you know, offensively, it's been a challenge for them over the years. And they have beaten some people up in the non-conference. And, again, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. But, um, you know, they lose two out of three at Georgia Tech. And, and uh, Georgia Tech playing pretty good baseball these days. And, it's you know, you know how they do it with Georgia and Georgia Tech? You know, they play one game in Atlanta at Tech. They play at Foley Field in Athens, and then they play on a neutral site, and that's the game that, that uh, Georgia won was the neutral side game. They got shelled at their place. Um, but, yeah, they're 13-3, and three, and uh, they'll play South Carolina Upstate tomorrow night. They swept Lipscomb over the weekend, and then they have uh, – let's say they, beat, they split with Georgia Southern in the midweek, and, of course, they lose the series to Georgia Tech. But, again, we'll get deeper into this. They have not really played anybody of consequence outside of Georgia Tech, and, of course, they lose that series. So I think it is an opportunity for us to go out there and win. I don't look at it as, oh, we need to go get a game. No, we need to get two, and if we can, we need to get three. But I expect these games to be very low scoring. I don't think Kellum Clark is going to see a fastball from anybody. <laughs> Just my honest opinion. Uh, I am sure that he has been nominated for SEC Player of the Week. Don't know if he gets it, but uh, certainly some guarding numbers for him. But uh, excited to get to Athens, excited uh, to get to the ballpark today and see what the Bulldogs have to offer. And, and again, you look at this thing and you say, okay, well, we, we have had some, some bumps along the way, which is true. But now you've won, you know, four of the last five. You win the day, you know, all of a sudden you start feeling a bit better about yourself. And above, among those games, the games the state has won have not been competitive. You know, when the bats get going, this is a difficult team to defend. It really is. So you get your dub today, you rest up, you get some arm care for your pitchers, and you get ready to go to Athens to open SEC play. And it's interesting, people are like, oh, but we're last in the SEC. Guys, none of that means anything right now. You can't tell anything about your team in a non-conference. Not yet. We're about to find out, uh, you know, separate the sheep from the goats here over the course of the next few weeks. So, Bulldogs still ranked in the polls for whatever that means. The only poll that counts is the last one. Uh, State was never number one at any point last year until the end. And, again, am I calling for a repeat? No, I'm not. I still think this is a team that um, has a chance to host a regional, but got to get off to a good start in SEC play. You get on there and have a loud weekend at Athens, and I think everybody will feel a whole lot better, feel a whole lot better. You win the day. And you go down there feeling a little bit better about yourself, starting to solidify your lineup a little bit. You've got your weekend rotation settled. And I said on the Bo Bound show this morning, I think you probably feel better about starting pitching today than you did this time last year. You know, this time last year, you know, Christian McLeod and Eric Sarantola had to go into that last non-conference weekend and kind of settle things down before we went to LSU. Bednar had not even really pitched. Remember, he had the little problem in his neck. We went out to Arlington had the stiffness, and you wondered and you worried. He comes back. We extend him a little bit the weekend before we go to LSU, and then all of a sudden, you know, Fristo comes out of the rotation. But I think we feel better right now after last week's pitching performances about our starting weekend rotation than we did last year, and I think that's a fair assessment. So if those guys can go out there and land the breaking ball, if those guys can go out there and be competitive – you know, against a Georgia team that is kind of up and down offensively too. And I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if we don't see a lot of, you know, five to four, four to three type ball games. They're going to know how to pitch it. 
we're going to have to have our big three, you know, our top four guys in the order. We got to have Luke, Cam, and LT get going. You know, Hunter Hines is a, is a guy that's a freshman. We're already expecting more from him than probably is fair, but he's delivered. But the reality of it is, we got a chance to go in there and really get a leg up early on uh, in the SEC race. And, and this, it is a marathon, not a sprint. That sounds like a cliche. But the reality of it is, is we're really just getting started. And State goes to Georgia, and then we get Alabama here before we make the track up to, uh, to see our friends at Fayetteville. Looking forward to being up there around the atmosphere and this Arkansas team playing exceptionally well. And you know they're on a mission too. And you know as well as I do, not just because of the fact that we have all been uh, in each other's face so much the last few years, but you know Arkansas, after us winning the NAFL championship last year when their greatest team of all time was eliminated uh, before they got to Omaha, you know, we're going to have targets on our back. We better be ready for that. But, again, that's three weeks away. Right now we focus on Bingington, and then we get ready to go play Georgia. And we'll see what happens. All right, final segment of the show brought to you by our friends at Portico. I told you guys before, if you're looking to move to Starkville, look no further than Portico. Very easy to find. Very easy to find information about, too. You take the turn off 82 on the 12, like going to campus, the very first ride is Pat Station Road that'll take you to Portico, 1.1 miles away from the Mississippi State campus, and it's on the quiet side of campus. You get the convenience of campus without the hustle and bustle of the other side. Very, very easy to get to, easy access to 25, 12, and 82, and, and as somebody that uh, travels as much as I do, the quicker that I can get on a major highway, the happier I am. If I was moving to Starkville now, I would move to Portico. I would encourage you to do the same. Whether you're looking to find a ball game weekend retreat or perhaps go ahead and start thinking about retiring, I'd like to have a place. I'd like to have a place in Starkville. We'll look no further than Portico. Our friend Brooks Bryan, Diamond Dog Brooks Bryan, 601-416-8075. Again, that's 601-416-8075. He can answer your questions. You can start with a two-bedroom, two-bath, three-bedroom, three-bath, four-bedroom, four-bath. You know, they've got a house for every, every size family, for every growing family. And a lot of you have dreamed about this time. Now you can make it a reality. Give Brooks a call today. Make Portico your next move. Okay. Uh, I would be remiss if we did not mention Glenn Gilbo's report yesterday. Glenn Gilbo reporting for Outkick.com that um, – Ben Howen's been fired. Okay, Ben Howen has not been fired. Now, will that report ultimately end up being proved correct? Yeah, I think so. I think we all know where this thing is trending. I've talked about it on the show for the last month. We all knew coming in that this staff needed to make the tournament in order to kind of hang on and be a part of the Mississippi State future. We did not make the NCAA tournament. We are, however, a three seed in the NIT. We have been very open that we would accept the bid. I really thought last week we wouldn't take the bid, and I was told, yep, we would. We absolutely would. And that's about the players, and that's encouraging to me. It's about the players. They've earned the opportunity to play in the NIT. They still want to play, so we're going to go play. And people are like, oh, my gosh, I want to root against Mississippi State. I don't want Ben Howland to go win the NIT and save his job. And Guys, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think there's any chance of that happening. I'm going to be pulling for the Bulldogs because I'm a Mississippi State guy. I'm pulling for our players. But I'm also pulling for change because I want a greater future in Mississippi State men's basketball. Now, the report comes out. John Cohen is on the air with the broadcast. I text John. I'm like, John, there's a report out here that Ben Howen's been fired. Well, the guy that will be doing the firing is, is in the building. And he's like, no. No, that's not true. Now, and here's the reality, too. And John makes uh, – offers me a quote uh, to share with you guys too and um you know it's really kind of a negative about journalism right now it's like there's all this desire to be right here's a quote from john msu plans to accept the bid of the nit should we be selected and coach howland intends to coach team those things are going to take place we did get a bid we are going to play at the university of virginia of course we can't host because of the uh renovations at humphrey coliseum begin right away but what's the harm in letting the players play You know, many of these players, too, are about to go through, you have a decision to make. Some may decide to go pro, whether that be overseas or maybe to test the waters of the NBA G League. I don't know. But the reality of it is, is that we don't lose anything by playing. 
And then some people are like, oh, let's just end it. Well, you know, it may end up of its own volition. You know, we may go lose at Virginia, and then it's over. But what have we lost as a fan base and as a university by allowing the players to go participate? You haven't. Now, some would argue, well, Steve, you know, the women last year would have been in the women's NIT, and we elected not to participate. That was a decision of uh, Nikki mcrae Pinson. You know, she wanted to get into an offseason. It had been a very tumultuous year for everybody involved, and I, I still commend to you, even though I know that Nikki mcrae Pinson made some mistakes, and probably a lot of mistakes. It's really unfair to judge anybody on that snapshot. You know, it's a very accomplished player and an assistant coach and a recruiter, and she comes here through an un- unprecedented circumstances. And uh, it didn't come together for us. And, again, it, it, ultimately it's her fault. But I don't think you can look at there and just say, well, you know, Nikki mccray Penson's a bum. I don't, I don't believe that at all. Yeah, not to mention you find out later that she has some health concerns that were kind of bubbling up in the background. It's a lot to ask of anybody. Doug Novak, of course, comes in and uh, you know, does a good job for us too. But, you know, the reality of it is, is I'm sure Nikki McCarpence is thinking, I just want to get this over and let me get with my team and let's start working on my things. You know, let's start working and get into an offseason. So that was the decision. Of course, the administration supported the decision uh, for, for this to, to decline the invitation to the women's in IT. This year, you know, obviously we've already got a new coach hired. And so I think it's one of those deals where it's just time now for, for Sam Purcell to get to work at Mississippi State. Now, he will after the Final Four, and that's, you know, we're only talking a couple of weeks. But he will be in constant communication with your players, and obviously he's going to be getting a staff hired. And that's probably one of the concerns that I have about all this is, you know, it's like if you hire a sitting head coach, they bring their people with them. Now, I suspect we're going to have some people here that will be retained. Mary Ann, I suspect, will hang on as director of uh, basketball ops. I, I, I don't know that, but I, I suspect that that makes perfect sense you know, for her to hang in here. You know, She was part of Vic Schaefer's staff and elected to stay here rather than go to Texas. And um, very, very popular on campus. And so you know, my hope is if she does get to continue, I'm hearing that she will. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, you know, that's, Sam's going to have to lean on some of the infrastructure that is already here while – you know, he's up there preparing, you know, Louisville for a run at a potential NAFL championship. So I guess in many respects, Bulldogs can be kind of pulling for that. But um, on the men's side, you know, I, I, I am eager to see how these recent openings impact our search. I think having a head start helps, but we're not going to win a betting war with Florida. We're not going to, nor should we even participate for a brand new coach. It's one thing to try to retain your coach. It's another thing to try to enter into a new relationship with a coach, and uh, they've got a much bigger checkbook than us. Uh, but the reality of it is, I think, you know, McMahon from, from uh, Murray State, and then, you know, Chris Jans, of course, and uh, Todd Golden from San Francisco. I think all three of those names are, are being prominently connected with Mississippi State, and rightfully so. Does Florida get involved with McMahon? Yeah. That sounds like a Scott Strickland type move. That could be rather interesting. We'll see how things progress there. Of course, you say, well, Steve, I didn't know there was an opening in Florida. Well, yes, Michael White leaves Florida for Georgia, kind of getting out while the getting is good. We all felt like Florida had a chance to make the tournament, and they have been kind of up and down and back and forth. They lose their first game of the SEC tournament, which pretty much sealed their fate of not making the big dance. So he leaves and goes to Georgia. And now Florida's looking for a coach. Uh, And, you know, so what will Scott do? How will that impact Mississippi State? Will he go chase McMahon, knowing that Mississippi State's been in contact with him? You know, there's going to be some overlap. These agents out here are trying to get the best deal possible for their clients. So, yeah, you're going to read some names that we have had mentioned in connection with our search, in connection with Florida, and possibly LSU. The LSU situation, I think, is a little more tenuous. And uh, the reason why is because – LSU was about to get absolutely hammered by the NCAA. I know people, oh, well, Steve, you know, know, we'll see. Seven level one violations, many with coach involvement. You know, and here is my attitude about that. You know, people say, well, you know, what about the kids? You know, well, the kids kind of know the risk when they go there, right? You make adult decisions, you got to deal with adult consequences. You know, the punishment has to be for the institution and for the fans. I think people, if, if people want the NCAA to take them seriously, you've got to make it so incredibly inconvenient 
that people would think, you know what, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to be involved in this. And the Will Wade details are incredible. You know, the allegations are that he used a bank account to uh, pay people off that had his wife's name on it. I, you know, that's just kind of like asking for trouble. It's kind of like using your university-issued cell phone to, to contact escort services. Why would you leave a paper trail? You know, and the fact that the direct coach is directly involved, and you, know, you can say, well, you know, how much did LSU know and when should they have known it? You know, L- LSU is kind of like the, uh, the Cajun Mafia, man. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. And you look at all this Title IX stuff, and you realize there are a lot of people up there that, you know, prioritize winning over everything else. And so I think LSU as an institution is going to be hit very hard. And I don't know that that provides, you know, a good landing spot for another coach. You know, maybe you go get a retread. Maybe you get somebody. uh, Maybe you get Andy Kennedy, you know, a guy that knows the league, a guy that, um, you know, would probably be happy to take a next step up and see. To me, that makes sense. you got to go get somebody that's willing to trade, you know, postseason experience for a check. And that's the thing I think about, too, if you're LSU. If, uh, you're gonna ha- if you're gonna have scholarship restrictions, and what if they put a postseason ban in play? And they certainly should. Well, who in the right mind is gonna go in the NCAA transfer portal and transfer to LSU knowing they can't go to the big dance? So that begins to you know, harm the, problem, the program, too. Okay, you go through the coaching change and you have your sanctions, but now all of a sudden there is this stigma about your program. It's like, yeah, LSU is great, but why would I go there if I, I know that the SEC tournament is the end for me? It doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't. So I think they're going to struggle. Scott Woodward is an outstanding athletic director. He'll get somebody, but I, you probably go get you know, a stopgap guy now. I don't think you go get somebody that's going to be a generational type coach. Maybe you go get somebody – to help you get through the sanctions, and then uh, you give them a year once the sanctions are lifted. It doesn't work out. Then you go then you go looking for big game. I just don't know that you're going to be able to go get a big-time coach, no, no matter how much you're willing to play, pay, knowing that uh, these sanctions are coming, and they could be rather significant. And I really think at the end of the day, the NCAA is looking to make an example out of somebody. It could be LSU. And I think the fact, too, that LSU continued to employ Will Wade, knowing these things were hanging over his head, I don't think that's going to sit well with the Committee on Infractions. Maybe I'm being a little bit Pollyannish here. I don't think anybody's going to say, you know what, hey, we are a repentant program. That's the one thing that happens is all of a sudden when coaches are implicated in wrongdoing, they get fired, and the school tries to distance themselves and say, hey, we don't support these actions. Well, she allowed Will Wade to stay. And they even had him sign an amended buyout that said, hey, if he was you know, cited in a notice of allegations, they could walk away debt free. Well, they are. You know, I'm sure there's probably some things out there, but what leverage does Will Wade have to hold LSU's feet to the fire about anything? And so that's rather interesting. Of course, you know, Missouri's now opened up. Uh, we'll see how things go. But uh, I do think Mississippi State is closer to naming a hire uh, than uh, probably a lot of people realize out there. Those of you that fi- have followed the search on the jeanspage.com message boards, you probably feel like you know, you're pretty in tune with what's going on. I feel like that we have a pretty good list of candidates here, and I think that uh, probably have narrowed the field some. And and a lot of people would say, well, Steve, why are we letting him coach? Why don't we just go ahead and announce he's not coming back? Trust me, anybody that's interested in our job already knows that's going to take place. You know, it's not like we have to run an ad in the paper, say, hey, wanted head basketball coach. These agents all talk. They all talk. They're all jockeying for position. They have been for some time. So – uh, yeah, the report, premature from Glenn Gilbo, who is a guy that's been in the game a long time. you know. And uh, ultimately, I think that report will be proved correct. But on its face, on Sunday, March 13th, it was incorrect. Ben Howland remains your basketball coach and will be through the NIT. And then I, I fully expect the a coaching change to be named then. So, again, you can't be prisoners of the moment. You can say, oh, well, we, we made the finals in the NIT again. No, you can't look at it that way because this is what we've proven is kind of our ceiling in many respects. We're always going to be that NCAA bubble team that ends up in the NIT. And like all of you, I'm ready to fill out a bracket, a March Madness bracket that has Mississippi State in it. I want to be able to play beyond the first weekend. And there was a time that men's basketball was one of the things that we were most proud of at Mississippi State. I think it's been a long time. You know, since we've been able to have that fervent interest in men's basketball. And I think a new coach, new renovations will go a long way towards changing that. And, again, it's never anything personal. 
It's always winning and losing. There are a lot of people that have coached at Mississippi State that I don't, I don't necessarily think are, you know, great people that have won a lot of games. But that's the thing is, you know, you can kind of be a jerk or you can win, but you can't be a jerk and, and not win. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting Ben Howland's a jerk. I think everybody will tell you Ben Howland is an absolute prince of a man. I've never heard anybody say anything negative about Ben Howland. The bottom line is he just didn't win enough. You know, and that's the thing. I think – actually, I think the fact that he is so well-liked probably got him more time than maybe you would have given somebody else. Yeah, you know, Rick Ray was a heck of a guy too. Rick Ray didn't win hardly at all. But then a better opportunity came along and we made a change. And I think this situation in some respects is very similar. You know, while Rick Ray is a guy too that didn't win, people will tell you what a great guy he is. Ben Howen's a great guy too. You know, Ben Howen, from the day he got here, talked about his faith and talked about his family and really kind of aligns with a lot of our values. But at the end of the day, if you don't win enough, you don't get to stay. And so I hate it when good people don't win enough. You know what I'm saying? It's like when you look at our, our sport and you look at athletics and, you know, some of the people that win the most are the, the ones that are the most difficult to deal with. You know, like Sylvester Croom, you know, a prince of a man, just didn't win enough. Nobody ever tell you that Sly's a bad guy. He just didn't win enough. You know, Gary Henderson, he's a great guy. Took an interim situation. We go to Omaha. You know, he'll have his picture, you know, uh, saved in our, our facility forever. It's one of the coaches that took us to Omaha as an interim coach. And Gary is a heck of a guy. And John Cohen had to make a difficult decision. And, and you know, he probably knows Gary as well as anybody in the world. And said, you know what? I want to go in a different direction. That proved to be the right thing. So at some point, you got to look at these things and realize that we don't know everything. We got a lot of opinions, and uh, I think people should feel free to share them. I just think that, uh, you know, sometimes, too, it's the, it's the same opinion no matter the topic. You know, it's like no matter what we do, there's always some way we can, you know, it's just like any thread sometimes, it doesn't matter if it's baseball or some way somebody finds it a way to make it about Michael Leach. You know, it's just same stuff, different day. But the reality of it is that we're going to play baseball today and uh, we're going to begin the SEC play this weekend. And I do believe that NIT will get going for us. And, and I believe we're going to make a coaching change on that side too. And I think in the end, you guys are going to be happy with the end result. Got to go win some games. Simple as that. Got to go win some games. Nobody ever signs up to, to be, be fans of a mediocre team. You want your team to be – competing for championships. And I can assure you that everybody involved uh, from Lee Hall to the Brian Bolden share that same passion. That's going to do it for today. We'll be back on Wednesday. We'll probably talk about baseball. And we'll talk about some basketball stuff, and we'll begin to move ahead. It's going to be spring practice before you know it, football. Excited about that, too. Year three, the first, the second full year, I guess, uh, for Michael H., here at Mississippi State, and uh, got to be a good year for us too. Need need a good year. First, need to continue to trend in the right direction. Need to build on. You, know, you went seven and five last year in regular season. We need to build on that this year. Keep going in the right direction. If you're looking for books, you can find them at dogpilethebook.com. I encourage you to. If you're looking for dogpile, you're probably better off buying through a vendor, whether that be a local bookstore, um, you know, or contacting Campus Bookmart. They have inventory. I just signed a bunch of stock for them. Uh, Book Martin Cafe has it. Uh, Maroon Company has it. Liza Tai has it. A um, lot of places have it. Lemuria Books, of course. Lorelei Books there in Vicksburg. Uh, Turnrow Books there in Greenwood. Uh, so you can find it just about anywhere. But I would encourage you at this point, if, if you need it right away, you need to order it through one of those folks. If you're looking for Stark Villains or Alpha Dogs or Flim Flam, you can find that through the Dogpile website. We'll get that right out to you. If you're looking for Stark Villains gear, you find it at StarkVillains.com. Thank you guys so much for being uh, so supportive of me over the years. Encourage you as always, go visit JeansPage.com, be a member, and uh, turn out and show up for the Bulldogs whenever you can and rep the brand wherever you go. There's not a lot of us, but uh, we, while we may be small, we are mighty. And let's be sure that the, the world knows that we're standing behind these diamond dogs. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live. Trends are always evolving, but so are you. That's why Macy's has the top brands, great value, and inspiration you need to own your style. 
This week, we're helping you do spring your way with designer suits for work or weekend, 50 to 75% off. And three-piece comforter sets, just $19.99. Plus, Macy's Star Rewards members earn on every purchase, except gift cards, services, and fees. Savings off sale and clearance prices, exclusions apply. Stop.